Chapter 33 The Remedy for Liberalism To Restore All in Christ For Great Evils, Great Remedies What is it that will be able to heal the cancer in the Church? The response is clear. The remedies must be applied which the popes have proposed against the modern errors, namely, Thomist philosophy, sound theology, and the law which flows from the first two sciences. You understand that, in order to combat the subjectivism and the rationalism which are at the basis of the liberal errors, I will not appeal to the modern philosophies, infected precisely with subjectivism or with rationalism. It is neither the subject nor its knowledge, nor its love, that the philosophy of all time, and metaphysics in particular, takes as its object. It is the very being of things. It is that which is. It is indeed being. With its laws and its principles that our most spontaneous knowledge uncovers, at its peak, the natural wisdom which is philosophy leads through theodicy or natural theology into the being par excellence, the being subsisting by itself. It is indeed this first being that common sense, supported, strengthened, and elevated by the data of the faith, prompts us to place at the summit of the real, according to the revealed definition, ego sum Qui sum, I am who am. You know indeed that to Moses, who is asking him his name, God answered, I am he who is. Which means, I am he who is through himself. I possess being through myself. Let us then ponder this being who subsists by himself, who has not received existence but who has it through himself. He is ens a se, being by itself, in opposition to all other things, who are ens ab alio, being through another, through the gift that God has given them of existence. We could meditate on this for hours. It is so striking, so unimaginable. To have been through oneself, this is to live in eternity. It is to be eternal. He who has been through himself can never have been without it. He who has been through himself can never have been without having it. Being could never have left him. He always is. He always will be. He always has been. On the contrary, he who is ens ab alio, a being through another, he has received being from another. Therefore, he has begun in time, at a given moment. He has begun. How this consideration should keep us in humility. Penetrate us with the nothing that we are in God's eyes. I am he who is. You are she who is not, said our Lord one day to a holy soul. How true that is! The deeper man penetrates into this principle of the simplest philosophy, the better he puts himself into his true place before God. The mere fact of saying, I am ab alio, God is ends a se. I have begun, but God is forever. What a piercing contrast! What an abyss between the two! So it is this little being, Ab Alio, who receives his being from God, who would then give himself the power to limit the glory of God. He would have the right to say to God, you have the right to this, but no more. Reign in the hearts, in the sacristies, in the chapels, yes, but in the street, in the city? No. 
What conceit! Likewise, would it be this being, Ab Alio, who would have the power to reform the plans of God, to make things be other than what they are, other than what God has made them? The laws that God, in His wisdom and His omnipotence, has appointed for all beings and especially for man and for society, these laws, the wretched being Ab Alio, would have the power to remake them at his caprice by saying, I am free. What pretension, what absurdity, this revolt of liberalism. Behold how important it is to possess a sound philosophy and thus to have a thorough knowledge of the natural, supernatural, social, and political order. For this, the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas is irreplaceable. I will not resist quoting for you Leo XIII in his encyclical Eterni Patris of August 4, 1879. Leo XIII writes, The angelic doctor considered the philosophical conclusions in the reasons and the very principles of things, now the extent of these principles and the innumerable truths that they contain in their bosom, the seeds of almost infinite truths, were to be unfolded in good time by teachers of subsequent ages with an ample yield for useful developments, which will be produced at the opportune time. In using as he does this same process in the refutation of errors, the great doctor arrived at this double result of repulsing by himself all the errors of earlier times and of supplying invincible arms in order to dispel those that will not fail to rise up in the future. End quote. It is especially to the modern errors of liberalism that Leo XIII wishes the remedy of Thomistic philosophy to be applied. Leo XIII continues, the immense peril into which the pestilence of perverse opinions has thrown the family and civil society is obvious to all of us. To be sure, both of them would enjoy a much greater peace and security if, in the academics and schools, a doctrine more sound and more consistent with the teaching of the Church were given, a doctrine such as is found in the works of Thomas Aquinas. What St. Thomas teaches us on the true nature of liberty, which in our time is degenerating into license, on the divine origin of all authority, on laws and their power, on the paternal and just government of sovereigns, on the obedience due to the highest powers, on the mutual charity which must reign among all men. What he tells us on these subjects and others of the same kind has an immense, invincible force to overturn all these principles of the new law, so full of dangers, and to establish the good order for the public welfare. End quote. In addition to the natural wisdom that is sound philosophy, he who wants to protect himself against liberalism will have to know the supernatural wisdom that is called theology. It is the theology of St. Thomas that the Church recommends among all others in order to acquire a thorough knowledge of the supernatural order. It is the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas that the fathers of the Council of Trent determined that, quote, in the midst of the Holy Assembly, along with the book of the Divine Scriptures and the decrees of the Supreme Pontiffs, on the altar itself be deposited the Summa, open, so that advice, reasons, and oracles could be drawn up from it. End quote. It is at the school of St. Thomas that the Council of Trent dispelled the first clouds of nascent naturalism. Who better than St. Thomas has shown that the supernatural order goes infinitely beyond the capacities and the very requirements of the natural order. He shows us how our Lord, through His redeeming sacrifice, by the application of His merits, has elevated the nature of the redeemed ones, by sanctifying grace, 
by baptism, by the other sacraments, by the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It is by knowing this theology well that we will increase in ourselves the spirit of faith, that is, the faith and the attitudes which correspond to a life of faith. Thus, in divine worship, when one truly has the faith, he has the gestures that flow from it. Precisely what we reproach the entire new liturgical reform with is that it gives us attitudes which are no longer attitudes of faith. It imposes on us a naturalistic and humanistic worship. It is in this way that people are afraid to make genuflections. They no longer want to manifest the adoration that is due to God. They want to reduce the sacred to the profane. This is the most sensitive thing for the persons who have contact with the new liturgy. They believe that the liturgy is flat, that it does not raise them up, that in it there are no longer any mysteries to be found. It is sound theology as well, which will fortify in us this conviction of faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ is God. This is the central truth of our faith, the divinity of our Lord. Then we will serve our Lord as God and not as a mere man. Beyond a doubt, it is by His humanity that He has sanctified us through the sanctifying grace which filled up His holy soul. This shows us the infinite respect that we must have for His holy humanity. Today, the danger is to make of our Lord a mere man, an extraordinary man, to be sure, a superman, but not the Son of God. On the contrary, if He truly is God, as the faith teaches, then everything changes. For from that moment on, He is the master of all things. In this case, all consequences flow from His divinity. Thus, all the attributes that theology has us acknowledge in God, His omnipotence, His omnipresence, his permanent and supreme causality in regard to everything, to all things that exist, for He is the source of being. All this is applied to our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. He thus has supremacy over all things. By His own nature, He is King, King of the universe. No creature or individual within society can escape His sovereignty, His sovereignty of power and His sovereignty of grace. As Holy Scripture tells us, it is in Him that all things have been created, those that are in the heavens and those that are on the earth. All has been created by Him and for Him. All things subsist in Him God has willed to reconcile all things to Himself through Him, those which are of the earth and those which are in the heavens, by making peace by the blood of His cross. Colossians 1.16 Therefore, from this first truth of faith, the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, is derived this second truth of faith, His royalty, and especially his kingship over societies, and the obedience which societies must have to the will of Jesus Christ, the submission which the civil laws must bring about with regard to the law of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even more so than this, our Lord wants souls to be saved. Doubtless indirectly, but effectively through a Christian civil society a society fully submissive to the gospel, which lends itself to His redeeming design to be the temporal instrument for the salvation of souls. From that moment on, what could be more just 
more necessary than civil laws which comply with the laws of Jesus Christ and punish with the coercion of penalties the transgressors of the laws of our Lord in public and social domains. Now precisely, religious liberty, that of the Freemasons, like that of Vatican II, wants to suppress this restraint. That is the ruin of the Christian social order. What does our Lord want if not that His redeeming sacrifice permeate civil society? What is Christian civilization? What is Christendom? If not the incarnation of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ in the life of an entire society. That is what is called the social reign of our Lord. Therefore, this is the truth that we must preach with the most vigor today, faced with liberalism. A second consequence of the divinity of Jesus Christ is that His redemption is not optional for eternal life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door. He says Himself, I am the door of the sheep. All those who have come before Me are robbers and thieves, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through Me, he will be saved. He will come in, and he will go out, and he will find the pastures. He is the only way of salvation for every man. St. Peter proclaims, Salvation is in no other, for there is under heaven no other name which has been given to men by which we must be saved. This truth is the one that must be reaffirmed the most today, in the face of the false ecumenism of a liberal nature, which assures us that there are values for salvation in all religions and that it is a question of developing them. If that were true, what good would missionaries be? It is exactly because there is no salvation in any other than Jesus Christ that the church is animated with the missionary spirit, with the spirit of conversion, which is the very spirit of the faith. In addition to philosophy and theology, it is necessary that a third science come to reduce the great truths of the natural order and of the supernatural order into juridical rules. Liberalism, indeed, even in its most moderated forms, proclaims the rights of man without God. There is nothing more indispensable, therefore, for the Catholic jurist than to base anew the rights of men living in society upon their duties towards God, upon the rights of God, of the rights of man, in truth, there are none except those which help him to submit to the rights of God. The same truth is expressed by saying that the positive law, that is the civil law, must be founded on the natural law. Pope Pius XII insisted on this principle against the error of juridical positivism, which makes of the arbitrary will of man the source of the law. Then there is the supernatural law, the rights of Jesus Christ and His Church, the rights of the souls redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. These rights of the Church and of Christian souls, with regard to the state, form what we have called the public law of the Church. This is a science that is practically annihilated by the conciliar declaration on religious liberty, as I have tried to show you. There is nothing more urgent still, therefore, than teaching afresh the public law of the Church, which gives the great principles that govern the relations between Church and State. On this subject, I recommend especially the reading of the Instituciones Juris Publici Ecclesiastici of Cardinal Ottaviani 
and of the work Ecclesia et Status Fontes Selecti by Giovanni Lograsso, a Jesuit. This latter work, in particular, supplies all the documents most unappreciated or thrown into oblivion by the liberals, from the 4th century all the way to the 20th century. Let us not forget, finally, that inexhaustible source of church law that is ecclesiastical history. It is thus that the attitude of the first Christian emperors, placing the temporal sword at the service of the spiritual power of the church in the fourth century, and constantly praised afterwards by the church, or indeed the courageous resistance of the bishops and popes against the princes usurping the spiritual power in the sequence of ages. This is quite simply dogma reduced to practice and represents the most fundamental refutation of all the liberalisms, the liberalism of the revolutionary persecutors of the church and the much more perfidious liberalism of the so-called liberal Catholics. <laughs>